will go into a very distractive behaviour if you start talking to your nephew and your nephew doesn't want to hear. You follow me? So your son will like get up and be distracted and distract you and want to get away from the whole conversation. That's what it will feel like. Um, when I say talk to your nephew, you can talk to him without your son being present, but your son will come and distract you if your nephew does not want to hear. Do you follow me? So you'll actually find that your nephew, his openness to hearing what you've got to say will be, will be displayed through your son's actions. Um, so if you notice that happening, talk to him about, you're now distra distracting me, you are now actually harming my son by pushing him around and getting him to do things because you don't want to hear and this is not very nice behaviour, this is not loving behaviour. And talk to him about love and, and how love is displayed. It's something that he didn't feel he had too much of on earth. And I always felt that he wanted me to be his mum. Yep. Because... Um, he feels very connected to your family. Yeah. yeah <clears throat> and that's... I felt that he, when he passed, he, he then uh, connected to my family because I was a lot closer to him than he was with his own mum. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And so he, I feel very strongly he will listen to you. Um, but there will be things that he w won't want to listen to. Um, so at those times you'll f feel he'll be trying to distract you from the conversation. But I feel he will listen to you and trust what you're saying. And the key is then to invite some brighter spirits who have been suicides themselves to actually help him through the process. On the divine path, explain to your nephew the two different paths of love, the divine love path, and the natural love path of love, if you can define those two paths to him, like I've sort of presented in the introductory DVD, you know, with all the spheres of the spirit world and the two paths, and just suggest to him that the faster way of progression is on the divine path, and, uh, and there are many spirits uh, who have committed suicide who are on the divine path, um, and Judas was one of those, all right? Um, so, you know, there are many spirits in the spirit world who can assist him uh, and, and, and assist him with what, firstly, the, what he did that, that, that many years ago, but also what he's doing now with his life. And he can be helped greatly to progress very rapidly if he follows that path. If he follows the natural love path, it will be a slower progression, but it will still be a very interesting progression for him, and, and he won't need to feel like he needs to stay on the earth and relive his life like he's currently feeling. He's feeling like his life was stolen from him um, by this spirit who influenced him to kill himself. He's realising now that he probably wouldn't have tried to jump if the spirit, you know, didn't influence him. He would have reconsidered. I mean, nobody else in the family wants to, to come to terms with the fact that there was a spirit influencing him at that time. Mm. I'm really the only one that feels very strongly about that. <laughs> no one else really wants to kind of... You know, no, do well, that. most most people generally don't want to know anything about the spirit world at all. No. Feel very afraid of it. Um, and then start to worry about things like negative spirit influence and occult and all those kind of things. And uh, so they become very afraid and so they don't really want to look at it. I think he's in the best possible hands yeah. um, with what you already know. Um, so if you just speak openly to him and yeah, just one more thing. He, um, so our, our son is quite psychic. Mm -hmm. He he'd be very mediumistic. He dreams a lot about things that then happen, but yeah. he's oftentimes get in, gets in quite a dark place about it. Yep. Um, he's quite a moody. I mean, he's a beautiful child, but yeah. quite get, can get quite moody. And but a lot of those summon. moods are actually the spirits with him. Yes, they're not actually his <coughs> moods. But he does actually express to me that when he has these dreams. It's normally not nice things that come true. He actually mm. dreams about like bad, bad things someone that dying are going to happen, or, being hurt or, or yeah, like an animal being killed, or hit, hit by a car, or, or or even just at school and and someone gets bullied. Or yeah. he said, "My mummy does." He said, "I have these dreams and they come true, but they're always not nice things." So if you can explain to him that actually it's a spirit telling him about these potential future events. And the reason why they're not nice things is because the spirit themselves is in a condition where they're worried about negative things all the time and so they're only telling him the negative things that are going to happen. And, if, and the key for, you, for the both of you is to allow yourself to be really open with your son about what's going on 
and really open with, uh, with him about um, soul condition as well, what it means to actually, the, that your son doesn't need to fear, that it's just a spirit telling him events and the spirit is only going to notice the kind of events uh, that are negative. It's a bit like, you know, the news today. Like, you think about that. There's usually 30 minutes of unpleasant information, isn't it? Why is that? Because the majority of people who watch it want to hear 30 minutes of unpleasant information, <laughs> right? There's a lot of good things. There's a lot of good things happening in the world too, and a lot of very newsworthy good things happening in the world. But uh, part of our psyche is often that we want to hear the bad things and don't want to see the good things. Well, it's the same emotion that's going on for the spirit who's control, you know, your nephew who's who's controlling your son. In that, in that he's just felt like his life was one series of sort of negative things to him, one after the other. And so now what he's doing is, is looking only for the negative things that will happen in your son's life in an effort to prevent them from occurring. And will that keep Connor, my son, in that same state so he can stay attached to him? Is that what It's not doing just it that. He's trying to prevent these negative things happening for your son. But unfortunately it creates fear in your son which actually attracts these negative things happening. Does that make sense? So he's thinking that he's trying to do something good for your son. Like the people who present the news often feel they're trying to do something good for the rest of the population in the same way, right? That, oh, we're letting them know of all the bad ways that you can get ripped off, for example, or all of these other things. Not realising that it actually creates more fear, which creates a law of attraction, which creates those events even more happening. So um, this is basically what's happening with him. His, his, his motive isn't bad. His motive is actually to prevent your son from having bad experiences. But in reality, what he's doing is prese he's presenting pictures of these bad experiences as for your son to walk away from and so forth. But it just makes your son feel afraid, which actually then creates an attraction to these. He gets worried about things that are going to happen then yes. he gets his real warrior and if you talk to him about it that's not his responsibility these things that are going to happen are just things that he's being told from a spirit are going to happen they might happen or they might not depending on the condition of the people involved but even if they do happen it's not his fault they happened so talk to him about that as well so tell him the truth of what's going on rather than uh, you know letting him believe the misinformation that other people will then tell him yeah Thank you. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Joseph at the back there. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Just as an extension to that, I was interested in the correlation, perhaps, between acknowledging and exploring emotions and the law of attraction. Mm -hmm. um, to give a personal example. Um, last week we had a discussion about the possibility of um, exploring my grief and along with grief comes feelings of fear, anger, denial, those sorts of things. Yep. I was just wondering about the correlation between that and, cause and the law of attraction where by exploring and feeling my anger and those sort of emotions yep. am I not creating more attraction for those sorts of, of emotions and experiences? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> the truth is the law of attraction, oh, let, let's see how I go with this. <laughs> the law of attraction is the most powerful when you're not feeling any of your emotions. So when you're walking around with it all squished down inside of you, the law of attraction is God's law to help you develop your soul to help you develop in love. It brings you these things to trigger these emotions. So in a perfect world, if we all knew the truth of it, we'd experience them, release them, and suddenly our, our, you know, we'd be more developed and our life would be better as a result and our negative law of attraction would decrease, our positive law of attraction would increase. So when we decide that we're going to explore our emotions, um, often what happens is 
immediately we go, okay, right, I've got grief, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into that. Sometimes our law of attraction pumps up a, a notch and suddenly there's all these events happening and we suddenly feel, oh my gosh. But that's, that's based on the law of desire. You've exercised a desire, I want to deal with this. God's tool to help you is to bring you all of these these events and people and so then you start as long as you start experiencing it it will dissipate quite rapidly as you release the causal emotion so when you're actually experiencing causal or going for causal emotion your law of attraction it won't be exacerbated only to the extent that your desire wants it to be is that clear so so really yeah so really um, there's two laws at work here there's the law of attraction, which Mary has talked to you about, and there's the law of desire, which Mary has mentioned. The law of attraction is always bringing you, as she's mentioned, always bringing you all these events to help you trigger your emotions and get towards God. What you've activated, though, in the last week is your law of desire, which is, a, which is, which is now ramping up everything as a result. You see, when your desire is very powerful. So... Let's say I have a desire to get away from my law of attraction. Then what will happen is that there's this, there's this law of attraction operating to bring me an event and then my desire is being exercised in exactly the opposite direction. <laughs> Does that make sense? And which will have a seeming effect of almost cancelling some of my law of attraction. So God's actually bringing me the, the law of attraction events and then I'm running away from them through my law of desire. I don't really want them to happen. And so my law of desire is creating different events. And that has a seeming impact upon me of, uh, you know, maybe my law of attraction wasn't that bad in the first place, right? But when you have a desire now to get closer to God and you actually activate that desire in a positive conscious way, your desire now ramps up. Like all of, it's like you've been asleep and then awake now with regard to that particular emotion. So before you might have been trying to suppress the emotion, get away from the emotion, now your desire is to get into the emotion. Now, your law of desire creates a whole series of attractions. Right? So you could think of your law of attraction as broken into two areas. There's the attractions based on the emotions that are within you that need to be released. Your, you, let's call them your negative emotions or your emotions that are disharmonious with love. Then there's all these positive emotions that create a whole new law of attraction that are positively, positive with love. Just the act of you wanting to deal with an emotion is an act that's far more loving to yourself. And that will ramp up this level of desire. And so what you will find happening is all of a sudden, new law of attraction events happen to you that didn't happen last week and didn't happen for weeks before then and maybe only sporadically occurred in your life. But all of a sudden now you're getting hammered with it this week just to help you through the getting in touch with these emotions. So it's actually a good thing, but most people believe it to be a bad thing. And so they shut it all down again. And this is where a lot of new age sort of thing goes. You know, if you, if you think about it more, you invite it. And this is very true. You, it will. You will invite it, hopefully, for the reason to actually deal with the causal emotion within yourself. But they don't go down that track. Instead, what they do is say, no, no, we don't want to invite it. We want to have a smooth life. And so what we do is we don't invite it. And then, the under, unfortunately, the causal emotion remains stuck within you, uh, probably in that state until you pass. So don't be afraid of your law of attraction ramping up once you set your desire to deal with a certain emotion. Has that been happening, Joseph? This week it has. <laughs> um... Not, not specifically to me this week. I mean, I haven't gone right into my emotions of grief. I've just sort of looked around the edges, um, having known grief well by losing a partner to a car accident. Yeah. Um, I feel at the moment comfortable just exploring what emotions are there that I know, yeah. uh, but not delving into them. But yeah, I, I just sort of... But your law of attraction has ramped up this week, hasn't it? It has. Yeah. So obviously at some level, at the soul level, you have actually set your intention through the law of desire to deal with this emotionally. Yes. I mean, it's, it's my intention to explore the emotions that I know are there, yeah. um, more specifically the ones that I know are knotted on the inside. Yeah. But with that desire um, comes a certain amount of 
feeling of fear, yep. apprehension, yep. and by experiencing the fear and apprehension, I feel like there is also a correlation with law of attraction in bringing um, situations that uh, promote fear for me. That's very true. And I was just, yeah, I was just interested to hear about that possible yep. snowball effect. Yep. Yeah. It, it's only a snowball for as long as it takes for you to release the, we, what you're doing is releasing your blocks, your, the fears that are blocking you actually experiencing the grief fully. So it, it'll only snowball until you deal with that fear and then it'll all be gone again. Because the truth is these fears have already always been within you. It's just in the past you've been able to ignore them or work around them better. Now your intention is to not do that anymore. So your intention now is to get to the causal emotion no matter what. And so what that means is that your fears that block you from accessing the causal emotion will be exposed so that you can actually feel your way through them. And the key is to feel your way through your fear but not live in it. So, so when something's triggered with fear and you start feeling the fear, allow yourself to physically feel the fear, like to actually tremble and shake and, and feel cold and all those kind of things that are all a part of the fear expression. That's the actual fear coming out of you now rather than you actually holding on to it. So allow that process to occur and you'll find underneath that will be some causal emotion which will flow readily after the blockage is released. Yeah. Um, I don't want to hog your time but just I, I see a correlation there. Um, last week it was interesting to be the only smoker um, amongst 130 or 140 people. Were you the and only smoker there, were you? Yeah. Well, the only one who went out to have one anyway. Perhaps, <laughs> and, and possibly I think there's quite a few smokers now. there. <laughs> it was mentioned to me that um, smoking was an expression of fear, but I can't remember what was said. Could you just give a brief rundown of how smoking relates to people's lives? Uh, certainly. I w it's different for each person. So uh, this is something that everyone needs to understand with a lot of these uh, things, emotions that drive. I wouldn't say smoking is actually related a lot to fear, although fear can be a part of it. Smoking at the causal level is actually related a lot to feelings of, uh, of low self-worth. In that uh, what happens generally is that we know we are harming our body, but we continue to choose to do it. Now, there's usually only a few emotional motivators for that. One of the emotional motivators is to detune from an emotion that we have, and so that causes us to pick up the cigarette. So, for example, if I just stop picking up the cigarette and feel the emotion, there's a very high likelihood of me getting to the, what the causal emotion is about me smoking. Now, that could be a number of different things. It could be literally hundreds of different things, depending on my life's experience. It could be things related to things like um, when I feel a feeling of internal anxiety, a, f a, f a, s a fag calms me down, right? So what, what's the problem? The problem is a fear that's arising and I'm using an external stimuli to calm that fear. And the cigarette itself may not physically calm the fear through its actions, just the act of smoking it may feel the calming sensation. Um, so a lot of times we can e be addicted to the act itself and not even the smoke or the cigarette itself. <coughs> and there can literally be from that state of fear right the way through to emotions. The key is to actually allow yourself to feel the emotion as you're picking up the cigarette. Like every single action you take is driven by an emotion you're either fully conscious of or fully in denial of inside of yourself. Now, we take a lot of actions fully conscious. So in other words, like I feel hungry, I'm conscious of my hunger, so I go and get something to satisfy my hunger. But a lot of our actions are actually what a lot of doctors and other people call subconscious. I don't call them subconscious, I call them in denial consciousness. Or in other words, we deny that we have them, but we act upon them anyway. And cigarette smoking is very much surrounding a group of emotions that are about what we want to stay away from. So, and we can use the cigarette then as a tool for staying away from that group of emotions. So the key is, with any addiction that we have, and by the way, food can be an addiction, watching telly can be an addiction, it's just as powerful as cigarette smoking, um, alcohol can be an addiction, and you can list sex can be an addiction, and so forth. There's literally like hundreds of different things, either good or not so good, 
that actually can be driven by an emotional avoidance. The key for us is to feel why you want to do it. So you want to have a warm cup of tea right now. How many of you feel like that right now? There's a feeling of cold in here, a bit cold, and you want to have a warm cup of tea? Well, why do I want to have a warm cup of tea? What's this warm cup of tea going to achieve for me? Right? Now, for many of you, and I know for Mary this is the case, it achieves her feeling of safety and security and, it, and, and she feels less fearful. Right? And cold and fear, there is a direct relationship to. So if you find yourself with your extremities cold a lot, it's a direct relation to that and fear. So obviously me then searching for a warm cup of tea becomes my addiction. It's like a cigarette for me. I'm getting a warm cup of tea that helps me calm down this emotion. I would be better off getting into the emotion and feeling the fear, fear that I feel and, uh, and working my way through that. But often we don't do that and we, seek, we search for the addiction instead. And the cigarette smoking is exactly the same action. Now many people unfortunately in society condemn the cigarette smoker when, and all they do is they replace that with lolly eating, food eating, you know, video watching, um, or any other number of a hundred things which are just as damaging in, in, the, in the way that they still get me away from feeling my emotion. So um, I don't feel that, that cigarette smoking is any worse or better than any of the other things I've mentioned. It's the intention that we have behind the action to cause us to, 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 get, to do the action. Interestingly as well, when you remove the addiction, often you don't immediately expose the emotion you're avoiding, you expose your blocks, you get cranky, or you, you know, all those things that we do to stay away from that emotion. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people who give up smoking get angry for the first 21 days, you know what I mean, and then they get over that. <laughs> it's because they're actually going through all the things they were avoiding to feel the underlying emotion. And unfortunately, the reason why it's 21 days is often we then use another learned technique to avoid the emotion in 21 days. Does that make sense? You, there's a common saying. There's a common saying that um, if you do something the same, t you know, if you do something the same for 21 days straight, it's now ingrained in you, right? And unfortunately, what we do with a lot of our stuff is that we just do, we just, you know, take away the cigarette smoking for 21 days. We're cranky for the 21 days. We don't deal with the, the emotions of crankiness, and we don't deal with the underlying causal emotion. And by 21 days, we've now learnt to use our lollies <laughs> in substitute for it, and so we're now satisfied by the lolly addiction, but it's still covering the same emotion. So, you know, this often happens. Like uh, yeah, that can be an addiction. A few people have that addiction. <laughs> I, I, I feel very sorry for you if you have that addiction. <laughs> I'd suggest you find a more pleasurable addiction. <laughs> Um, who is, sorry? Oh, I was just wondering, this lady here hasn't ha have had your hand up a few times. Yeah, yeah, can you, can you answer your question? Thank you. Um, Jason was very brave, so... <laughs> I'm the first person that I know in listening to many of your DVDs that's come out as being gay. Yeah. And I have a huge amount of... Um, 60 odd years of suffering with uh, guilt and shame. Yep. I've done a lot of work in uh, moving all my emotions and I'm a bit stuck. Yep. I need some help. Yep. And um, when I was born, I was born with a hair lip yep. and I feel that the doctor had a shock and the, my mother didn't accept it well. Yep. I have a memory of being in the birth canal and not wanting to come out. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a self-deception. Mm -hmm. But in utero I felt at one with my mother and beautiful and warm and safe. And then I didn't want to come out the birth canal because I thought I'm going to come out with a hair lip and I'm going to be gay and I'm going to be rejected. And I don't know if that's self-deception. But the thing is I felt when I started studying psychology the teacher wrote maternal deprivation up on the board mm -hmm. and I went hot and cold and thought I was going to faint mm -hmm. and said gosh that's what I've got mm -hmm. and I've been working on trying to heal it mm -hmm. for many years. So can I've got I, all can this... I describe to you what actually happened during... I'd love during to know what happened uh, when I was born and why I had a hair lip because I want to work on the self-love. Yeah. 
And this will help address the issue of uh, being gay too, right? Because there are very much close relationships between all of these events. Yes, today I got, in my depth of moving, I got feeling flawed and a misfit and I've always felt wrong and guilty. Yep, okay. Um, your mother and father um, have some, ha and they're not still alive. No, they're both passed yeah. over. They had some very um, strong emotions about gay people. Um, they never discussed them very much with you because there was never, they never felt the need to discuss them with you because you weren't open about how you were feeling. But if you had have discussed them with them, their reaction would have been quite strong in the negative. I did tell my mother in my 40s or something. I don't think she talked to me for about six months. Yeah, that's right. Um, they, they both have some very, very strong emotions about uh, being gay. Your family is a little religious background too? Uh, no, my father was an atheist yeah, and my mother. mother sort of went to church but yeah. not really. Yeah. But my father and brother were what I would call sex addicts. Yeah. And so the heterosexual sexual element yeah. was discussed at the dinner table. There was so much going on in the house that yeah. was quite repulsive yeah. and affected my digestion as yeah. well. Yeah. So there was such, when I realised I was gay and had my first relationship, I wanted to commit suicide because I, th I actually remember thinking that it would be best, uh, in my family's ethos, yeah. it would be better to be a murderess than to be gay. Yeah, and that, that is, you're exactly right. Your family had these really, really strong emotions, negative emotions uh, and very unloving emotions towards any gay person and, and didn't. Um, ironically, um, I feel there probably were some, under, like some of your other parts of your family were gay as well, by the way. So, but anyway, we'll talk about that at maybe a different time. But um, the problem, the problem was when you were when you were first incarnated, there was this huge discrepancy, and the reason why you feel such feelings of being unwanted is that there is this huge emotion coming from your fam your parents that that of non-acceptance of your ba one of your basic soul qualities which is the the gay part of the soul so in other words it's your sexuality and there was this there was this instant rejection that you felt the moment you incarnated of your own sexuality and because of that instant rejection even though your mother has treated you quite well in other aspects there's this, there was this instant rejection of this basic part of yourself, which means that you've never felt like you've ever been accepted by them, by your family, I'm speaking. And, uh, and that's what the emotion is that you're really dealing with. It's the, de it's, it's the rejection of your own sexuality, which caused you then through your life to reject your own sexuality uh, 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 on many occasions, but also to reject your own sexuality in terms of to, to feel that you're actually in error with it. To, this, there's this belief now that's inside of you that, you know, there's something wrong with you. Right? It has felt that I was in error with God. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this was also part of the reason why I brought up this thing about uh, your mum being having some religious connotations in there is that your mother had this belief quite strongly inside of herself as well. And so there's this deep rejection that you, were, that you were feeling from your family, but there's also this deep emotion inside of you that, that, that your mum had, that God rejects such people, is, you know. And, and this is not true, but it's not something that you've yet to actually accept inside of yourself emotionally, because what you'll need to do is grieve the feeling of not being accepted by God, and grieve the feeling of not being accepted by your family. So that means going through those emotions. Does that make sense? It means allowing yourself to feel your way through those emotions. When you feel your way through those emotions, you'll start feeling God's love enter you, and you'll know for certain that God actually loves you no matter what your sexual orientation is. And by the way, your sexual orientation is a soul condition that is true, it's not a soul condition based on error. Does that make sense? Yes, my burning question is, is my other half a female? 
Yes. <laughs> well, you already know that. <laughs> <laughs> but you, yeah, you already know that. And this is a this is a trouble with a lot of the projections we get from our family sexually, is that we end up having some really basic core beliefs about ourselves that we can't accept all of our life, and it's such a it's such a damaging damaging thing to actually get these projections from our family and from from society. And so many people who are gay. Um, live with these deep emotional hurts all of their life, never feel fulfilled all of their life because they have this deep hurt inside of themselves that they'll never be accepted and even that God hates them, that, God, that, that there's something wrong with them that God has made and it's like a punishment from God almost. And, uh, and these are you know, all religious beliefs that we need to get rid of really on the divine path. Um, there are many religions on earth who believe that being gay is, is wrong in God's sight. Um, and that includes the Buddhist faith, for example, also believe that gay, being gay is wrong. And most Christian faiths believe that gay is wrong. And, so, and when you think about it, even most people on earth have this tendency to believe that it's wrong because of the aspect of reproduction. And, uh, and these are all issues that need to be sorted out um, at the emotional level. So it's lovely that you asked that question. And it's also good for you to have a good cry. <laughs> Can we just ask one more question while you're able to? <laughs> Can't tell you how grateful I am. Such a relief. Yeah. I've got more crying of relief to do, yeah. but I met someone 16 years ago. The next question you're going to ask is about is soulmates. She my <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I say something generally about soulmates? I will not say to a person who their soulmate is, even if I know who their soulmate is. Now the reason why I don't is there are a number of really good reasons for this. Firstly, the issue of the soulmate relationship is the other half of yourself. So you remember in the way that it works is the soul, the complete soul, splits in half at incarnation. One half incarnates into one form, one body. The other half incarnates into another form, another body. So we've got two separate people seemingly connected to each, but they are actually one soul. One soul expressed in two different forms, if you like. Now, um, Part of your progression and part of the greatest law of attraction that ever will operate upon your soul, besides your law of attraction with God, is going the law of, the law of attraction that brings your soulmate half together. Now, the problem with me saying who a person's soulmate is, is that there's a tendency then for that person to not work through their emotions, which prevent them from either being with their soulmate or from going through the process of a soul union, which is actually joining with your soulmate in a physical and emotional and spiritual sense. And so what often happens is we then say, oh, they are my soulmate, and we start putting up with treatment that we would never have put up with if we didn't know that they were our soulmate. Right? So for example, you know, our soulmate might not be in too good a condition, and our soulmate wa might want to manipulate me. And, and so the feeling I have is, well, they are my soulmate, so I've got to put up with it. No, you don't. But often we'll have that belief, right, inside of us. Or we might have the feeling, oh, they are my soulmate, so you know, I've got to stay with them no matter what, even if they treat me badly, right? So no, you don't have to do that, right? The truth is you need to work through your emotions inside of yourself or why you have such little worth to yourself to even do that. Now, if a person is told also about the, a certain person is their soulmate, they've never had to trust their own feelings about the matter, and yet it's one of the greatest relationships you'll ever have. And yet you're not trusting your feelings, you're trusting mine, which is very damaging to you. It's really important that you trust your feelings on, on things, on, on the matter. So, 
my suggestion is with all the questions about soulmates, and by the way, we will be having myself and Mary will be presenting a soulmate discussion, like a four-hour soulmate discussion at some point in the future, which there'll be a DVD of it, I'm sure. And my suggestion is have a look at that when we talk about it. But a lot of people have this in, come in with the soulmate relationship thinking it's what it isn't and assuming it to be things that it's not and expecting it to be things that it's not without working through different emotions that cause it to be and in the end often have a lot of damage as a result of that and that's one of the reasons why I don't want to say to anybody who your soulmate is until I know perhaps that you've had your own acknowledgement and you know within yourself who it is and then I might talk freely about it although even then what I'll do is I'll say I'll reflect back at you that you believe this person to be your soulmate but often I won't actually say that they are you want to say a few things about soulmates babe? no I just wanted to say about uh, sexuality I just really wanted to reinforce to you how much uh, God does love you and has absolutely, uh, you know, loves you just as you are with whatever sexuality, you know, uh, orientation that you have. We have a, a beautiful couple who regularly come to the groups in Queensland, Brian and Ian, and um, Brian especially has done a lot of work around this issue and has really experienced that love from God uh, and had a lot of healing within himself. So, yeah, just go for it, hey. Um. I hear what you say about not saying who my soulmate is, but I've done, I ha I've shut down sexually and have for 14 years, and I feel I'm uh, done all the work that I know to do uh, on myself. And you've ta often talked about soulmate relationships being terribly difficult, and that one was heaven and hell, and. I ran away through terror mm. and I became very ill and I was very ill and nearly died for about eight years so I actually have terror in moving I, I've been feeling that this person is mm. and I've been praying to God and I've been working on it for days mm. and I guess I just would be so terrified to go forward in any way if it was a self-deceptive emotion. Yeah, see, this is where me telling you something is not going to be very helpful to you. My suggestion is, is that um, you need to follow through with your own desires and feelings. And, and, and by the way, this applies to everyone. You need to follow through with your own desires and feelings and even if you fear them to be wrong, Right, so if you have a desire to go down a certain direction but you have a fear to be, to be wrong, you're, if you follow your fear, you're actually in a place that's not loving towards yourself. So the key is to look at your fears of, as false expectations appearing real to you rather than as being real. And at the moment what many of us do is we look at our fears as being real because of past events and therefore, then we shut down our desire as a result of that, which is something you actually did 14 years ago. My suggestion is allow yourself to work through your emotions regarding your sexuality. One of these emotions, obviously, is the opinion that God has of you. You need to work through this emotionally with God. Another one of them is the opinion you have of yourself, and you need to work through that emotionally as well. And then there's this third aspect of it is how you're very afraid of what others will think of you. And then you need to work through that set of circumstances and situation yourself. Now when you do that, you will actually be in a condition where even if this person was your soulmate, they'll be automatically drawn back into your life. Do you follow me? Because our soulmate attraction is so strong. When we're acting in harmony with love, so love of God, love of ourselves, love of our soulmate, our soulmate will feel drawn back to the, relation, the relationship if, if the soulmate had re left the relationship. And if, it, if that person isn't your soulmate, your real soulmate will be drawn into your life too. Does that make sense? So you can't go wrong either way doing it that way. You follow me? If you actually work your way through the emotions that you feel regarding your sexuality in particular. 
what a lot of people do instead of doing that is they select the person and then <laughs> have a relationship and then work through their stuff. But, you know, you, there is the potential under those circumstances that you're going to have to leave the relationship, even if that relationship is a soulmate, if that person is your soulmate, because you may never deal with your emotions about your fears and, and, and other things while you're with them. And you may need to actually leave the relationship to do that. And, and that's been the case for us, definitely. We've been in relationship and out of relationship and it's only been through this process of dealing through specific emotions for both of us that we've come back together. Yeah. And uh, I thought that I had, had love addiction and I made myself wrong. And uh, um, so I know that I've worked through a lot of my neediness and I've changed a lot. Mm -hmm. But I ha guess I have a fear, you know, if, um, they say in AA, I'm uh, alcoholic and I'll be one forever or something. Yeah. I mean, first of all, was I in love addiction? And, and secondly, you know, could you talk about love addiction, please? Because I don't know if that's just a concept from society or what? Um, any addiction we have, including, let's put in quotation marks, love addiction, um, a lot of times we look at a love addiction and we think, oh, that's a good addiction. Like, for many of us, when we hear the word love addiction, we think, oh, what's wrong with being addicted to love? You know, that's a no, this is the very bad connotation okay. of love addiction. Anything that creates pain for us is based around fear rather than love. So if we have a feeling inside of us that we don't have love in our lives and we have a lot of pain surrounding that, then that's created by some emotions inside of us that we still need to work through. Allow yourself to work through those emotions. They're all surrounding a deep sense of self-worth or a lack of self-worth that you have as a result of these childhood events. So when you let yourself feel about the childhood events, in other words, feel that mum didn't love you, for example, or accept your, or, or accept your sexuality, allow yourself to feel that emotionally and pray to God about that and, and as you do you'll find that God can reach in and take that emotion out of you and give you some divine love in its place and as you deal with those emotions you'll get to a point where you actually feel good about yourself. Now when you're in that state where you feel good about yourself you don't need somebody else to satisfy you in any way. What that means then is that you are in the best possible position to give love as a gift rather than having it as an expectation. Do, do you follow what I mean? See what happens is if I've got this hole inside of me about how I feel about myself I'm going to expect Mary to satisfy this hole. If I fix this hole I don't have an expectation on Mary anymore. Right? She, has, she doesn't even need to love me anymore. She doesn't have to love me anymore. But what I can do is give her the gift of my love. And I can do that in a fully expressive way without actually feeling like she has to do anything in return for me. Does that make sense? And when I'm in that state, I've healed completely this hole inside of myself about how I view myself. Now, in, in the next weekend that we've got coming up, we're going to do a talk about love of self. And, and that will be a very good talk for you to get a DVD of if you can and to work your way through some of the feelings of love of self and uh, it's the love of self that creates the lack of love of self that creates that hole and I've had a, a lot of my life and only recently dealing with it Thank you and thanks so much for your time and the hair lip you said you'd say something about Oh yes, um, all physical deformities at birth uh, or physical pro problems during birth that occur are actually the emotional condition of the parents involved and not the child. So it's actually the creation of it was caused by your parents' emotions about a physical deformity. Does that make sense? It's not actually your soul that created it, it's your parents' soul's condition that created it. Yes, I've been feeling that my mother actually was shocked and horrified because they were sort of good-looking socialites yep. and that 
but she couldn't feel it because she denied all of her sad emotions. She only, she only did the happy ones. Your mum had, was very focused on what other people thought of her and very image conscious. And it was these emotions within her that caused her to be image constant, conscious that created firstly the attraction of your gay soul and also then the def that, th that created the deformities to your physical body. And, our, um, and because it was such a pronounced thing in the face, like it was something that she couldn't hide. And if she had dealt with the emotions, um, you could have actually been healed as well quite naturally. But of course the doctor also had the same response and therefore operated and so forth. And you went through a series of operations, didn't you, I, I feel? Um, fixing the, the, the problem. And in fact, when you connect to God completely yourself and become at one with God, any physical problems that are still there now regarding it um, will all be removed anyway. So it's all recoverable from, but understand it's again not your creation. It was the creation of, like all of these emotions you've listed today and, in, and physical things that you've listed today have all been the creation of your parents and their own suppression of their own emotion. And so there's some grief in you that you'll need to feel about that. And to be frank, there's also your, your parents in the spirit world also need to feel some grief about that because they are in quite a stuck state in the spirit world because of a lot of these emotions that are still within them. Mm. All right. Such a blessing to have you both. Thank you so much. And by the way, I'm not saying all these things just to cheer you up. <laughs> um, I, I don't worry, I processed um, if, if I everything before setting. I came. I thought, if he says my soulmate's a man, I'll accept yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, which wouldn't have been the truth either, by the way. But I just that, want the truth. Because at the soul level, um, even if I'd said to you, your soulmate's a male, you wouldn't have felt that here inside of you, right? And so... Um, you know, you, you, and you don't feel that. So, so asking me the question really, and this is part of the thing you need to work through, you weren't actually trusting your own emotions, your own feelings about your own sexuality. My suggestion is to really start trusting a lot of these things going on inside of you rather than mistrusting them. At the moment, you're mistrusting a lot of them, which is causing a lot of your internal distress, and you need to start trusting them. Yeah, it comes from that seed of feeling wrong and guilty. Exactly. And mm. so that's a core emotion for you to work mm. your way through. And when you release that emotion, you'll be start trusting yourself a lot more and feel less inclined to worry about what everyone around you feels about you in any way, in terms of appearance or, and in terms of uh, sexuality and, and all of those kind of aspects. And the guilt around being gay caused me to feel separate from God. And so uh, that being healed mm. will allow me to trust my intuition better. Totally. It'll be, it, it's going to be such a, like the next few months in particular are going to be such healing, a lot of healing months for you. It should be very good for you. Be a relief, hey? Yeah. So grateful. Yeah, thank you. Um, Gerard, if we can go across the, sorry, I'm just, I'm just trying to get people who uh, haven't asked a question just yet. So. If you turn, if you turn on the sound, and, and, and sorry, 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 sorry. Um, I have to go. I have to get up a couple of times at least each night. Not that, that, you know, it's a mature man issue. And so, what can we be more specific? <laughs> <laughs> what effect? What effect does that have? No, I'm going to ask you to be more specific. Oh, I, I know to, what it means. No, I need to go to the toilet. Issue. Okay. You need to go to the toilet. Okay. A couple of times. Be open about these oh, things. We all go to the toilet. Okay, so I have to go to the toilet. It's a no need to be ashamed not a common it. problem for me. Yeah. Um, what Can I, I wanted say to say something. That, that is one of the reasons why you need to go to the toilet. There is firstly some shame about your own uh, gender that you need to work through. But keep on asking the question. Yeah, fine. I think there's also a lot of fear somehow. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, and I'm trying to work with that at the moment. But my main question was really just in terms of contact with the spirit world, which occurs at night. What impact is that having in the, in, in the case of my spirit connection with the spirit world, the fact that it obviously can't take place continually during the night because of that disturbance? Is that an, imp is that an issue or is it something that, anything I can do about that? Or? 
Uh, certainly, there's more of an issue for your for your physical body. Your physical body, when you sleep at night, goes through a lot of processes of recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more your sleep is interrupted, obviously the less chance your physical body has to recover. Now, the major driving force of your physical body, though, is actually your soul condition. So, so anything that I deal with at the soul level will affect my spirit, my, my physical body. So any problem that I generate over time, and in many times as we age, we start, problems start becoming more pronounced. The reason why they become more pronounced is because we've denied our emotion for such a long time that there is a larger physical effect upon our body than if we just deny that emotion for a short time. The body is a wonderful piece of machinery in that it, it tries to recover itself constantly. The entire processes of regeneration of each cell, the, regen the, the whole um, waste removal system and everything, it was all about recovering the body back to its pristine condition. It's the emotions within us that prevent that from occurring. And so the key is, rather than addressing the issue, well, I need to sleep at night, look at why you're not sleeping at night, which is related to needing to go to the toilet during the night a number of times, and that's changed for you over the years. So obviously it's a, a degenerating issue caused by an emotion. So it has an emotion, something to do with that. Allow yourself to start investigating it emotionally rather than looking for a physical cure of the issue or worrying too much about your sleep state experience. Does that make sense? And all those other things will all come together. So look at the emotional reason why you feel like you need to, to go to the toilet during the night more often now than you did when you were younger. Is that your prostate? Would be... No? Sorry, I'm sorry, but I have to talk to her. Some she fear. Said I should really so when you did a session with Millie, she came up with some fear. She said I should be dealing with, them. and I am starting to work with that. Yeah. And uh, and fear surrounding. She 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 made it. Just left that. I, I, I've got. I just said you don't have to talk about it. I know how. I know so much. So yeah. many reasons for that to be. Of there. why you're afraid. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And I won't. I probably is a lot I don't know, but I know enough to start with. Okay, good. <laughs> So the, my suggestion is if just do all the things that you know, there's a high likelihood that the things you know that are, are already related to it. In fact, many times I find when we're discussing things with people, often they identify their own problem in the question itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, this happens all the time in groups in that many times the, the actual question itself is worded in such a way that they've identified their own issue without even really being conscious of it or sure. aware of it. <laughs> so it, it, you work with the things you already know and then if you get stuck with that then then mm -hmm. ask questions about that, you mm -hmm. know, of God firstly and yes. then uh, you'll get the answers, you know, to assist you further through, mm -hmm. through the issue. While I've got the microphone, can I ask another quick question about prayer? Sure. And, and, and the prayer on the website, the only prayer you need is the prayer I use. But then often I hear reference to perhaps praying to God for something in particular. When I say that prayer to myself, it's all encompassing. It's covering everything in my life and whatever's coming up for me seems to be covered in the prayer. Um, is that appropriate? Is, it, is, that, is that the way? It, or, or should there be some specific recognition of some other issue but I, I seem to feel it's always there yeah and the, the prayer when I first designed the prayer which is 2,000 years ago and um, I designed it in such a way that it accomplished it accomplished so many issues or accompanied so many issues in the one prayer mm. issues of unworthiness mm. and all those kind of feelings which prevent a lot of our connection an understanding of the spirit world an understanding of faith and other other aspects mm. But understand that prayer is about desire too. So every time you actually exercise your desire, you are actually praying. Now if your desire is being exercised in an unloving way, then you're actually praying for something unloving. <laughs> if your desire is exercised in a loving way, in harmony with love or truth, then your, your prayer is now harmonious with love. So this is why God answers most of our desires, because our desires are actually prayers. And if we have sincere desires, that's like already praying. 
So you can have a desire in an instant in your soul. It doesn't have to be accompanied with words. And this is something to bear in mind, is that we don't need to actually accompany our desires with words. We can just exercise our desire, and our desire is what creates the prayer, and that's what creates the communion with God. God listens entirely to your desires, if they are harmonious with love. And so exercise those desires, build those desires, and that's a big part of prayer as well, understanding that every time you have a desire, you're actually also praying to God. And every time you're grateful for something that comes into your life at an emotional level, you would now express thanks to God. And, and the key is to stay in those states for as long as you can as well, you know. Besides dealing with the unloving emotions that are within us, be in those states with regard to love and exercise those desires. And you're praying more and more often when you do that. Yeah. And you'll also find everything around you will change a lot more rapidly when you do it as well. So many of us have desires that we then suppress completely. And we, we are very, very focused often on suppressing our desires most ruthlessly in our lives, thinking we can't have them, we shouldn't have them, we can't, you know, it's bad for us to have them, it's selfish for us to have them and so forth. And, and it's our desire that actually creates our longings. And our longings are what our prayers to God firstly and then to others. Yeah. So every time you have a longing, you're already praying. Yeah. And it helps to sometimes say the words of the prayer that have been given, but you don't have to in order to have the longing. Yeah. And Dave, you had a question? Oh, sorry, there's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Reincarnation, you hit on it before. Um, how long between reading your lives, number one, and how many times do you get reincarnated? Um, well, firstly, uh, I don't know what, whether you want to answer this one, dear. <laughs> I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, no. no, you don't. <laughs> okay, you can say no too. Um, firstly, Reincarnation is not a forced process. So in other words, um, you're never forced to reincarnate. Um, so this whole viewpoint, the, the very Eastern viewpoint that's prevalent on Earth now of you die, you go into the spirit world, you have sort of a life review, and then you reincarnate very rapidly after that. And the purpose of reincarnation is working through your karma. In other words, you know, working through your, your, the things you did in previous lives and you learn new things and, and so forth and so forth. And that's the general position of reincarnation in particularly New Age philosophies and other, based on other religious philosophies. That viewpoint of reincarnation isn't correct. Um, it's very much based around spirits and their viewpoints of wanting to get back to Earth and wanting to actually attach to people on Earth in order to re-express their unlived lives, similar to what your own uh, nephew had done, right? Uh, in the sense that, you know, you could say him doing that caused you to believe that maybe your son is a, your reincarnated nephew, right? The reality is quite different. What happens is that when we pass, we uh, do at times have what you would say is a life review, but all that is is your soul condition drawing you to a location and it becomes a stark reality to yourself what your actual condition is right at that moment. Now, you then from that moment can progress in the spirit world. You, you don't have to come back to earth. And in fact, there's many billions of spirits who know this that have never come back to earth, never attempted to come back to earth, and they can you can actually progress infinitely. You never have to return to this dimension in order to progress. So that takes away this idea that you have to reincarnate. Does that make sense? Reincarnation then becomes a choice. And the, clear and the condition is, how do we make the choice? If we wanted to come back, when could we make the choice? Well, if you talk to lots of spirits, you'll find out that actually nobody in the spirit world who believes the beliefs of reincarnation has ever personally in reincarnated. And uh, 
And because of that, there are even now in the sixth sphere of the spirit world, which is a fairly highly progressed state, it's the state where you're perfected in natural love, there are literally millions or billions of spirits who still believe in reincarnation in the way that they were taught it on earth, but they personally have never reincarnated. And, the, and their explanation of it is that we don't need to because we're now perfected in love. So they basically put that proviso on it. The truth is, is that even if they wanted to, they couldn't at that condition. Because to reincarnate, the soul has to be in a soul union condition. So remember, the process of incarnation is the soul is one whole complete soul and it splits into halves and incarnates. Now to reincarnate, the soul has to be in a conscious soul union state again in order to reincarnate. It's the only possible way of incarnating is for the soul to go through the split process to incarnate. So to reincarnate, it's got to go through the same split process. The only time that that can occur is if the soul has progressed to the 22nd sphere condition, which is a soul union condition. Up until that point, you will be separate from your soul mate. And what's happening is as you're growing and as you're experiencing, you're learning to use your free will and your soulmate's learning to use your free will. And the two of you become more and more attracted to each other and eventually you get to the point right at the pinnacle of the 21st sphere where you go through a process. And this process is a process of union. The soul joins back together again as one soul. You become genderless, if you like. Or you could think of it as the two halves are in constant sexual union at the 22nd sphere state. The difference between that state and when you began was that when you began you weren't conscious of that state and you never had this experience and so you didn't have all the choices of free will that brought you to this state. You also had never received divine love at the beginning. You only received divine love through conscious choice which is also something that's often taught on earth in error. You know, on earth we're often taught that we automatically got divine love in our soul and all we've got to do is come to a knowledge of it. The truth is actually that the only way you can receive divine love in your soul is to actually ask for it, is to have a desire for it. Because you can understand the law of free will prevents it from entering you unless you have a desire. So divine love entering you causes you to go through this, into this process of a soul union. When you're in a soul union state, now you can reincarnate if you choose to. Uh, but why would you choose to? if you could continue to progress from that state to further states of existence without reincarnating? And the answer is, there's only really one reason why you'd choose to, and that is to express the love that you have at that condition back in this earth or physical condition. That's the only reason for doing it. And so the, when reincarnation began, which was in 1962, um, on this earth, that was the reason why it began, because the people who did it uh, wanted to re-express re that love back on earth. And then there was a series of souls who have reincarnated since that time. Now, in time it will be demonstrated to everyone the difference between the belief systems in the Eastern philosophies and the truth of reincarnation. And so at the moment, it can't really be demonstrated clearly without the people who have reincarnated getting in the condition where they can demonstrate the truths of, that, of these two different states. But that is the actual physical mechanism, if you like, of what happens in reincarnation. So there is no need uh, to reincarnate at all. And in fact, the majority of spirits who have s taught reincarnation in their own lives have never uh, reincarnated and even don't even have a desire to reincarnate either. And, uh, and yet reincarnation, you'll notice, has become a popular teaching from the 50s or 60s onwards. And the question then becomes, well, why is that? And the answer is because for the first time in humanity, in this earth, reincarnation actually occurred. And spirits in the spirit world came to know that the reincarnation process did occur. And so then they started thinking about the reincarnation process again. And co-relating it with all of their old beliefs about it and wondering whether that was their way to progress. Now there are many spirits in the sixth sphere of the spirit world who can't progress above the sixth sphere of the spirit world because they haven't received divine love. 
and they're looking for mechanized ways to get to the seventh sphere. And what I mean by mechanized ways, I'm, I mean they're looking for physical things they can do in order to get to the seventh sphere. And so many of them believe that reincarnation is this physical way they'll be able to achieve that. That's not true, however. The only way you can achieve the transition from the sixth to the seventh sphere is by receiving divine love and actually going through a soul transformation, which every one of those six sphere spirits is capable of doing, but often doesn't want to because they were searching still for the physical way of doing it rather than looking at the soul. Many of them still do not have an understanding of the soul itself, thinking that the soul is the spirit body. And so many of them never actually discover the process of, of, of getting to the seventh sphere and so they're refocusing their attention now that they know reincarnation has occurred they're refocusing their attention back on earth in order to reincarnate themselves to work out a way to do it if you like not understanding that the way to do it is not based upon their intellectual or understanding abilities it's all based on this divine love entering the soul and reaching you to a soul union state which is like 14 spheres removed from their state and once they reach that state, they then can reincarnate if they chose to. And there are now uh, souls in that state who are reincarnating uh, more and more. So um, there are some of them who had experiences on earth where they didn't live very long on earth or didn't live at all. You know, they, they were terminated or uh, so aborted or miscarried. And many, some of them have the desire to come back and so forth. So as time goes on, there will be more and more reincarnated souls. But those ones had to have reached that soul union state first before they could reincarnate. Does that make sense? There's a whole... Uh, I have to go over the tape. <laughs> you have, have to, go. to go over the tape to listen to no it. No worries. <laughs> um, I've written a, a, a book about it. Uh, it's not it's a, in draft form. It's on the, on the CD. Um, it's under the Divine Love um, folder on the CD called... Um, I think it's Qualities of Divine Truth, Reincarnation and Divine Love. And what I've done is outlined in there the process of, of reincarnation, as I've just described it to you, but also a lot of the reasons why people on earth today believe in reincarnation in its old form, which is very much like what's happening to your son uh, or your nephew with your son, uh, very much like the spirit connections that occur because of certain feelings of unlived lives in the spirit world and the reconnection to people on earth. And there are literally, uh, you know, there's literally hundreds of reasons why a person may choose to believe the reincarnation beliefs. Most of them are based on four or five basic premises which I cover in, in the discussion in that presentation. So I might suggest to have a, have a read of that as well. As it's a book that I've got in there called, I think it's under Divine Love, called A.J. Miller. Um, so you know how I've titled them all by the writer. So it's just A.J. Miller and then Dash, um, Qualities of a Line of Truth, Reincarnation and Divine Love is what it's called, or Reincarnation and Divine Love. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say he did a much better job than I would. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but anyway. <laughs> Um, that's a good time for my question, actually. Yeah. So, uh, God designed us to exist or be born in.